so folks, one thing I've said, and so many others have said it as well, is that everything in the family of Old Donnie is transactional. It's not about love. It's not even really about loyalty. It's about what can you do for me? And as soon as that's gone, we are going to take each other and twist the knife in the back. And that's what happened as Trump's kids, at least Ivanka, and maybe especially Ivanka, have made deals, last second moves to save themselves and absolutely doom daddy. Hit the like and subscribe button. It really helps me out. And we're going to jump right into the fact that what we're seeing from her and even from the brothers, at least to some degree, is a a last second deal that they're securing to save themselves, if only partially, and put daddy all the way six feet under as they deny their own responsibility and blame it all on the guy with the orange hair. Trump will have to sell everything that's owned by the New York based entity, including Mar-a-Lago. Don Jr. is one of those people who doesn't know he's not smart. Yeah. If, if it were me, and I had an inkling that I was not smart. I would not talk. Don Jr. does whatever he can to protect his dad and make his dad love him. Including selling what little might be left of his soul. And Eric, same. But Ivanka, right, She, ha her husband manages $2 billion of Saudi money. She doesn't have to sell hats <laughs> to buy her jewelry, right? This case is such a bad case for Trump. This is a ticking clock in the end of Trump having a family business in New York. I am happy to have you be the very first guest for DEF CON catch-up. This is to determine the catch-up threat level. I would say we're looking at eight. If we're at eight today of little hotel uh, bottles yeah. of catch-up, I am going to need bigger, bigger bottles. You are absolutely going to love this. So sit back and enjoy the ride. It might come up. Yeah, good, good point. Uh, Norm, Ivanka Trump is appealing a judge's ruling, ordering her to testify in this uh, civil fraud trial next week. How do you see this playing out? Uh, I think she's unlikely to be successful uh, in that appeal, Wolf. It is true that she was dismissed from the case because her management responsibilities uh, in these businesses came outside of the statute of limitations. But she still has uh, firsthand evidence uh, about these gaps in the valuation uh, where uh, they they shift. Sometimes they're many times the actual value of the properties. Uh, the judge and uh, the state are entitled to that testimony. She also could be potentially a very damaging witness against her father and her brothers and the Trump organization. And I think she is going to be forced to testify. Your accountants to give information to your accountants. Right. That's a little bit of a circular problem there. How would you be advising? I mean, obviously, you're not read into the full details of this because you're not their lawyer. But like, it does seem like a real conundrum to me about how all the kids testify. Well, I think that one of the things that you saw from Don Jr.'s testimony today in terms of reading the transcripts and understanding that is that they are going to likely try and put everyone in a silo in such a way that they are not necessarily connecting their actions to the actions of their siblings and trying to minimize whatever level of connection exists between their actions and what it is that they were responsible right. for and the other people. And I think that that's something that is to be expected because it is the best way to minimize the notion of this was something that they were all in on and connected with. Yeah, and it seems that Donald Trump's son, Eric, on the witness stand today in New York, testifying in the fraud trial against the Trump family business. Don Jr. finished his testimony earlier today, and the brothers are executive vice presidents at the Trump Organization. They're also co-defendants in this trial. CNN's Brent Gingrass is outside the courtroom, and Brent, there were some tense exchanges between Eric Trump and the assistant attorney general about the president's financial statements. What happened there? 
Yeah, Jessica, it's important to keep in mind as we follow this trial, these financial statements are the heart of the case. And so when the state's attorney general, uh, assistant attorney general, was questioning Eric Trump on the stand, she was asking him questions about how long has he been aware of financial statements? Has he had any part in preparing those financial statements? And Eric Trump essentially under oath said that he wasn't even aware of financial statements until the investigation from the AG started just a few years ago. Well, the assistant attorney general questioning him brought up emails, brought up phone calls, brought up testimony from prior witnesses, making it clear that he had knowledge about his father's financial statement of conditions from more than a decade ago. Let me bring up one graphic to show you exactly what was said on the stand. The question was, so you did know about your father's annual financial statement as of August 20th, 2013, didn't you? And that was from the state's attorney. And it's in an Eric Trump response. It appears that way, yes. So a little bit of a contradiction in the testimony of Eric Trump. This led to a very tense exchange. Our fellow colleagues in the courtroom say Eric Trump leaned forward into the microphone and yelled a little bit louder that he again, had no part in preparing the financial statements uh, of his father. Again, information that is very much at the heart of this case. Now, not distancing himself from the preparation of those statements is also something his older brother, Don Jr., did pretty much on the stand for the entire three hours that he testified. When he was finished, he did come down the courtroom steps and he went to the camera. I want you to hear what he said about this civil fraud trial. Before even having a day in court, I'm apparently guilty uh, of fraud for relying on my accountant to do, wait for it, accounting. I mean, think about that. What, what does that do for literally any other business? Now, these sentiments sound probably very familiar to you if you're following this because we've heard much of this same uh, argument made by his father when he comes to the microphone. Uh, Don Jr., a little bit less contentious on the stand. We'll see how Eric Trump's testimony continues. Um, it's unclear how long he will be on the stand if cross-examination is going to happen from the defense. But, of course, we have everyone in the courtroom. We'll continue to follow this for you guys and keep you updated. Bryn Gingras for us outside the courtroom in New York. Thanks so much. Let's bring in CNN senior political commentator Scott Jennings. Um, Scott, the opponent of the former president, Ron DeSantis, made a really interesting point, I think, which is one that we all know. But the candidate saying it out loud that basically the legal cases starting uh, with the New York DA's case really shifted the dynamics of this race when that first happened. And he's never really recovered since, paraphrasing to some degree. Is that going to change at all? Well, not in the Republican primary. If you look at the latest national surveys and you look at some of the state by state stuff, Trump continues to go up and up and up. Republicans just don't believe it. And they think that this election in general is a chance to get vindication for these court cases, for the impeachments, for Russia, for policy disputes, for all of it, really. And that's how they view it. Now, the question is, will general election voters view it that way? I have my doubts. I think if Trump is convicted of a felony in any of these cases, there will be a cohort of voters, some Republicans who just don't want to associate their franchise with a convicted felon or don't think someone who's been convicted should be in the White House. And that could be enough to to scramble his reelection plans. Uh, of course, on the Democratic side, the scrambling, I think, could be if the third party candidates have ballot access in enough states. And so you see a situation here where the electorate is could, could find themselves very unsatisfied <laughs> with either a convicted felon or a president that they think is too old to serve a second term. What about the president really disregarding the gag orders repeatedly that, you know, judges have placed on him in some of these cases? Clearly, I think making this guy, the calculation, Scott, that the legal price is worth the political gain. Yeah, no question. That that would be off brand to follow the rules and to, and to do what, you know, the, the, the people who are persecuting us want us to do. Uh, I mean, I think he's going to continue to violate it. I mean, it, that's that's the brand. It's worth it for him to thumb his nose at the system here. Uh, so I, I I'm not surprised at all. I think it's part of the strategy. And I think when he does things like this, I think Republicans uh, who support him strongly uh, appreciate it. That's what they want him to do. He, they even, think something was weird if he didn't. Even if it lands him in jail for a short period of time. I mean, Ty Cobb, who was one of the president's attorneys way back when, said he thinks, you know, if he keeps violating these gag orders, president could spend a little bit of time in jail. If they throw Donald Trump in jail, if you think people, his people support him now, throw him in jail and see what happens. I mean, yeah. 
I mean, the, 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 it will be further evidence of what the argument he's making is they're using the legal system to try to keep you from, you know, having your, your day at the ballot box next November. I mean, that, that would be further evidence. So, I, I mean, I think you ought to face the same laws and consequences any of the rest of us would if we were in the same circumstances. But the, but the reaction to that, the political reaction to that, to me, is, is quite obvious. Scott, I, I don't want to go off brand myself and ask about policy instead of politics here and these dynamics in the race. <laughs> but as all this is going on, we've written some of it. The New York Times has written a series of great stories about the outside groups of former Trump advisors who are planning for the 2025 inauguration, of that administration, how different it will be, how they'll have people, loyalists, that will be willing to do what very rock group conservative Republican lawyers in the last administration we're not willing to do. I know you're both familiar with those Republicans and those lawyers, but also the policies that they're talking about here. What's your read on it when you see that? Because one of the biggest weaknesses of the first Trump administration was it couldn't actually deliver from the executive branch unless it was some agency issue. They're saying now they will be able to. So you can see that, right? Ivanka is definitely throwing daddy under the bus. And as we've talked about earlier today, we've mentioned it in some of the clips I've played and, and I've been saying this, clearly there's an effort to deflect. And while that deflection isn't always aimed explicitly at dad, right? It's like, oh, I don't know this. I don't know that. Maybe it was the accountants. The effect is to get dad in trouble because one of these four has to take the fall right? Weisselberg's already gone to prison, right? For this, he's already done time. And, you know, he's, in, he's, in a, I think a, one of the defendants in this case, but, but the big target is on one of these four. And if all three of the kids to in varying ways say, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. There's the accountants. It was this guy. It was the coffee lady. I don't know who signed off on this. Then eventually the, 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 the game of musical chairs will end and only Donald won't have a chair to put his butt in and he'll crash on the ground, cracking his tailbone. Like it's going to be ridiculous, right? And that's what's happening. And they're all doing it at the last second because they realize that if there's any chance, maybe there's some way that they could save themselves, their reputation, their pocketbooks, what have you. I don't know if it's going to work, but if it does... Everybody has a chance at getting something better for themselves, except for Daddy Dearest. 